This week on the Arabidopsis Research Roundup, I'm joined by uh, Professor Keith Lindsay from Durham University, and uh, we're going to be talking about a recent paper that uh, he published in um, New Phytologist, and the title of the paper is Abscisic Acid Regulates Root Growth Under Osmotic Stress Conditions Via an Interacting Hormonal Network with Cytokine in Ethylene and Auxin. So, good morning, Keith. And uh, the first thing that, uh, that strikes me with this paper, it's very ambitious to, to try and pull together these four different hormone um, signaling in, into its one stress response. So, can you take, take us through the rationale behind the paper and then what you, what you achieved in this? Sure. Well, um... I mean, drought is, is a major limit to uh, crop productivity. It's the, it's the biggest limitation to crop productivity. And it's a, it's a very complex, it's, it's like a syndrome, really. It's a sort of a complex um, combination of effects on the plant from effects on shoot growth, root growth, stomatal aperture, and all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. We're particularly focusing on osmotic stress as one of the components of the drought effect or drought response, and in particular looking at root growth. Um, uh, and soil conditions and, and drought have quite an effect on root architecture, on the growth of the primary root and lateral roots. And it's, it's well known that um, a variety of hormones have an effect, an effect on, on the architecture of the root system. Um, so what we wanted to do was to investigate um, the effect of osmotic stress specifically on uh, this signalling network. Um, and what we did was we induced os osmotic stress by the use of polyethylene glycol. Um, now, there's a lot of previous work on, on the role of ABA in, in drought responses and osmotic responses. Um, but um, so, so typically, um, ABA concentrations increase on drought, and depending on the amount of ABA accumulating, you can get more or less root growth. Okay. Um, but it's also known that other, other hormones like auxin and cytokine and ethylene influence uh, root growth and root architecture. And the question we are interested in is how these various hormones interact with each other to give a phenotype in response to osmotic stress. Okay. Uh, now, a few years ago, we developed um, an, a, a model, um, a, a sort of a predictive model, describing interactions between um, auxins, auxin, um, ethylene and cytokinin. And then we sort of upgraded that by including pin proteins. And um, what we've done in this paper is incorporate data on... Uh, the effect of osmotic stress on, on that network, um, including effects on ABA. Right, okay. So we used um, a series of um, molecular markers of various response pathways and linked those to osmotic stress. And um, well, what we found was, first of all, what we would expect is that ABA um, dependent and also ABA independent stress pathways are activated in response to osmotic stress in, in the system that we were using and, and um, the, the treatments we used induced um, uh, an inhibition of primary root growth and also lateral root growth actually. Okay. Now what one might imagine is that this is primarily due to an ethylene effect that's, that's induced. Um, it's known that um, ethylene has, has quite a dramatic effect on both auxin transport and, and pin, pin um, levels mm -hmm. to move auxin up to the elongation zone to in, induce inhibition. Okay. What we found, actually, was that um, the effects of ABA don't, in the system, work through the effect primarily on ethylene, but actually on auxin. So what we found okay. was that um, um, uh, ethylene mutants, for example, were, were behaving just like wild type in response to this osmotic stress. Mm -hmm. But what was happening was um, that the auxin response in the meristem was reduced. The amount of um, PIN1 
which delivers auxin into the meristem was reduced. PIN4 in the meristem is also reduced. Okay. And, um, uh, and actually, PIN2, so there's a sort of a tissue-specific effect here. PIN2, which, which is taking auxin up the root, yep. was increased. Okay. So you end up with um, reduced auxin, reduced auxin responses in the meristem, and in fact, a smaller meristem. Okay. And what what the, the data suggest is that actually the primary effect of osmotic stress in the system is to reduce auxin delivery to the meristem to restrict the size of the meristem. And in fact, you can you can add auxin back and and get recovery of the of the root meristem size. So, okay. um, so that was. Slight, to some extent, unexpected, because I think we thought that ethylene was probably going to be the, the main reason for the inhibited root growth, but in fact it seems not to be that. And okay. so, um, so what we have is this sort of interesting interaction, which we formalised in, um, so we went on to produce a sort of a, a formalisation of this in a, in a network mm-hmm. um, to describe these interactions and... and what, what is interesting is that, you know, you change one thing uh, and a lot of other, everything else changes as well. And so the way in which this network behaves is very much sort of context-dependent, um, cell-type-dependent, and so on. So um, so that's the sort of take-home message, actually. Yeah, no, I would encourage people to, to look at the paper, and the, and the network um, which you, you put towards the, the back is really, in my memory at least, one of the first attempts to really pull everything together in one in one kind of model or diagram at least it's uh, it's an, it's an impressive event so so you think that although this paper is specific to osmotic stress you think the it, the the network would respond similarly to different um, different challenges um, well that's, that, that, that's what I think in, in terms of um, the behavior of the root of course I mean it's driven by hormone networks and we don't have a, obviously a comprehensive um, collection of hormones. I mean, in, in the paper also we talk about um, about effect on the DELA proteins as well, mm-hmm. and they, they go up and they're part of the growth inhibition response. Yeah. But they're not really formally at the moment part of the network. Gibberellins are not really part of it. So, okay. um, so on the one hand, we want to sort of expand the model in terms of... Um, new components in it. Mm -hmm. We want to expand it in terms of investigating response to different environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we're doing is, um, so so the model that's in in the paper is effectively a sort of a virtual single cell model. Um, Although although we've got two models there, one for um, cells containing PIN1 and one for cells containing PIN2. So there's sort of a, a separation in that sense. But mm-hmm. we have produced um, a sort of a two-dimensional spatial model of a root, which um, dem- uh, where, we, where we're investigating interactions of each network in each cell, mm-hmm. and, and, and that creates, and, um, creates patterns of gene expression in a, in a predictive way that seems to work very well. And we're extending that model more realistic okay so that's the future that's the the future work so are you able to get a sufficiently detailed model with the like molecular tools available at present so and you you must be somewhat inhibited or limited by what you could do by um the difficulties of zooming in on specific cell types is that true yeah yeah that is true but um one of the one of the things that we can do and we are doing this we haven't published any of this yet but we're something up okay. is um, act- actually modeling a whole range of different parameters in each cell to find out what works in, in what gives known um, patterns of expression and that's quite informative about what's potentially happening in in different cell types across the root in a, in a realistic root cell pattern okay. so that then informs um, future experiments so we can then zoom in uh, um, in a more detailed way using available markers to try to analyse or, or validate, if you like, the model using um, using molecular tools once we've got a model from, from that type of system. 
Excellent. Okay, cool. So it's great to see. I mean, we, we have a history, and I, I, when, I was, when I was working with this 15 years ago as part of my PhD with, with Malcolm Bennett, it, was, uh, it w- wasn't quite as complex, the, the system. So it's great to see it really evolving through your work, with Malcolm's work, with Ben Shearer's and yes, Phil Benfield's yes, work. Yes, it's, really, yes. it's really coming on nicely. Excellent. Yes. But, uh, absolutely. All right, so, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Keith, for, uh, for spending some time today. Okay. It's a pleasure to uh, talk to you again.